Hello. So I'm Michael, uh, and I'm with Data Pulse, and uh, we are an alternative data provider, um, and we specialize in internet infrastructure data for a number of sectors. Uh, I thought we should each could take, each panelist could take maybe 30 to 60 seconds to expand a little bit on the introduction that's just been made so we all kind of know what roles we all play. Okay, thank you. Thank you, for Beryl, for having me here. Joe Simonian, Acadian Asset Management, uh, around a $100 billion AUM quant firm out of Boston, uh, where we manage quant equity long only, uh, long short hedge funds. Uh, my role at Acadian is a senior investment strategist where our mandate is to work with um, you know, some of our largest clients on custom solutions. Um, uh, given my background in machine learning and data science, uh, as the co-editor of the Journal of Financial Data Science, a lot of my work entails um, working with clients on implementing and understanding data science, machine learning, and all data. Thank you. Yeah, Peng Cheng, JP Morgan. So I'm part of the JP Morgan Global Research. Uh, our clients are basically buy-side clients, hedge funds, mutual funds, et cetera, et cetera. And my role is basically uh, the head of machine learning strategies where you know, we try to work with our clients and educate our clients on how to use machine learning and big data and implement into their actual uh, investment decision process. Hi, Katerina Lipitova. I'm a product specialist with Research Signals product of IHS Market. We provide stock selection signals, factors, and models on a variety of data sets, fundamental, uh, proprietary alternative data sources, as well as unique um, niche data providers as well. So um, we provide these stock selection signals on more than 30 plus data sources, which in effect give our clients an efficient way of uh, con uh, consuming this uh, derived signals with an efficient and cost-effective way. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jonathan Burko. I'm the, uh, uh, I guess, head of alternative data at Alliance Bernstein. Um, prior to this, my role was uh, being a portfolio manager of uh, systematic strategies across equity investments, as well as uh, macro uh, strategies. And uh, at AB, my role is to really help the firm uh, leverage a lot of these uh, different data sets and use advanced techniques like machine learning or natural language processing and help our PMs and uh, analysts be able to access information that they may not even realize is, is out there and available. And I think uh, that we'll kind of touch on some of those points here, but I think it's the, my goal is sort of to educate and get all the analysts to be very, just realize that they can be creative with what data is available and that's out there in the ecosystem. And I'm sure we'll talk about a few examples of that in a, in a few minutes. Uh, so I'll go back to the, one of the previous panels that was talking about the proliferation of alternative data providers and data sets. Uh, and so with the in, ever increasing number of things to look at, there's sort of an initial task in separating the wheat from the chaff, you might say. Uh, but assuming you can find the wheat, then there's the next task of actually being able to operationalize the data and continue to get value from it. Uh, there's often, you know, hiccups. Uh, there's a series of challenges involved in that operational process. So I was wondering if uh, any panel members can start to share their perspectives on what some of the more common pitfalls are, how to avoid them, uh, and, and in general, how to navigate the road. So Joe, would you like to start? Yeah, I think the most fundamental pitfall potentially is when you, um, talk to a data provider and um, there is a set of data or a data process that, that you like, uh, you realize that you can't integrate it with your existing investment process. And I think for the larger quant managers, um, that can be a challenge because uh, most of us have developed our process over many years. And you know, it's just like when you take medicine, the medicine itself has a, a structure, but your body has a structure. That's why some people have side effects, some, that's why other, others don't. It's the same thing with, with using all data or any kind of data, but especially all data, because you have a process that has already matured and developed to a certain extent, and uh, integrating any new component, whether it's a new investment signal or an alter, a new type of data, uh, requires there to be a you know, harmonious interaction. And if you don't have that, then you either have to work hard to develop that harmony, or you have to pass. And so I think that's the, the sort of the, the first order challenge for any asset manager. Jonathan? Well, I, th I think there are actually a couple of mistakes that are kind of pervasive across the industry. And one is 
driven by the, the nature of how many uh, different firms are out there providing uh, alternative data. And I think most firms kind of get, they say, oh, there's thousands of data sets, there's, there's 30 different uh, providers of uh, geolocation data, and so everyone just gets really, really overwhelmed. And so from our perspective, and probably, you know, it doesn't matter what kind of your investment style you have, but I think it's important to start with a question. So what is the investment thesis? Are you trying to look at data in a specific sector? Are you trying to answer a thesis about competition among two market participants in Japan? What is the specific thesis? And chances are, and what I try to tell our team is that there's going to be data out there no matter what the question is. It may not be the perfect data set, but you may be able to get some proxies. So I think that most firms, they if you start with kind of what data is out there as opposed to what question I have, that's really the mistake I think many, many firms have, many firms make, and that's why, you know, it's, this is such a challenge. So, Ping, Katerina, anything to add on that? So we mostly work with quantitative firms, right? And uh, though uh, some success stories um, from the fundamental side and challenges that we see they've been able to overcome on the more of a larger fundamental firms, which incorporated the data strategy into their process. So uh, what we're seeing more and more is fundamental managers are adapting this um, quantitative approach to data evaluation. This is what needs to happen. Essentially, we live in the world of information and data where we'll only get more data out there. So for fundamental managers to be more successful and to overcome some of the challenges with uh, being unindated with amounts of information and extracting some of that value, they need to incorporate uh, the data strategy into their approach, similarly to what Quant's been doing. So essentially, build this integrated, uh, integrated approach of investment management and data. So in effect, putting the data into a, pro a profit center. If they don't do it, they may stay behind, essentially. So um, what we've been seeing is that integration of both. And those two teams working together, um, understanding, as, uh, as Jonathan had just pointing out, what are, the, what are those um, driving factors? Turn it off. <laughs> what are those key driving factors? I, I don't think our microphones work. Hello? Yeah. Um, so basically, what, what are the key driving factors for different industries? Um, what are uh, the KPIs? And really translating, really translating um, those into the data items. So uh, speaking to the data teams and for those data teams to go out there and find those data sources to incorporate into the uh, investment process. So I think that's when you will be able to find that success. All right. Uh, and then when we had our kind of our pre-panel huddle call, um, we talked about some uh, alt data uh, with some unique challenges or uh, unique opportunities. Uh, and we talked about internal data as alternative data. And Peng, do you have some thoughts about that you'd like to share? Uh, yeah, sure. So internal data, obviously JP Morgan being a big organization, we have a lot of uh, internal data available. But you know, I think it's really kind of um, being a big organization is also a big drawback because you know we are very conservative on what kind of data we can use. For example, like Chase credit card data, uh, we have not been able to uh, you know, utilize it. We are still in the process of uh, negotiating with Chase. Uh, on the other hand, we also have our JP Morgan Prime brokerage data, where you know we can see our client positioning. But obviously, we also deal with uh, those data with very very high sensitivity. You know, for our purposes, we try to be very, um, you know, only look at a high level data and, you know, not, instead of, you know, trying to use the data to generate lots of trading signals, we simply use it to provide market color, you know. But, you know, those are generally the kind of examples, uh, you know, that's uh, in the process right now where we're utilizing our internal data. But, you know, obviously, as you can see, it's actually a very, very uh, promising direction because the public data has been kind of, you know, utilized and analyzed over and over again, whereas internal data, I think, is a very big area. And, you know, even for us, we're only looking at, you know, tip of the iceberg. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, potential to go. But, you know, the challenge is basically to kind of get through the regulatory and the, admi uh, the administrative constraints. And once we get through those, you know, we can hopefully add a lot more value to, you know, what our alternative offering is. Any other thoughts to share? Okay. 
Um, a couple other unique kind of areas where we talked about challenges where is it with ESG data and associated cybersecurity issues. So, uh, Katerina, do you want to take the lead on that one? Sure, yes. Yeah, so, there are a couple of challenges with the ESG data. So, for those investors that are trying to incorporate sustainability uh, strategies. So, first, um, of course, you need to choose what uh, ESG provider you're going to choose, right? And the challenges has had been that there are so many frameworks um, none of the frameworks really match up to each other, and when you actually look at the data providers, the items from the ESG, they don't necessarily correlate next to each other. So as an, as a, an investor, you have to essentially create your own um, framework. What does it mean to you? Um, uh, to, to, what, does, what does ESG really mean to you? Um, so in, in effect, what you have to what you have to do is understand uh, what are the data providers uh, uh, ESG data providers providing to you. In some cases, uh, those are the company specific uh, reported data, and that data not doesn't uh, necessarily provide that accurate and objective information because it's company reported. So. In effect, you, what you need to do is incorporate additional data sources into it. So we've been seeing um, uh, investment managers using alternative data sources to enhance ESG strategies. So things like um, uh, social, uh, social media sentiment, news sentiment, as well as, um, as, well as uh, um, employee reviews from like Glassdoor, um, additional uh, traction we've been seeing specifically from one of the de data sets that we have in house is cybersecurity factors. So uh, those are being used as a kind of missing, uh, missing factor from the governance perspective of ESG. And uh, we've recently actually done the study uh, incorporating uh, those cybersecurity signals with ESG and saw um, a, before, uh, a performance improvement, specifically on the downside, uh, kind of on the downside risk. So all of those alternative data sources can only enhance those ESG kind of strategies, uh, particularly because you have so many challenges with the frameworks and correlations of these data sources. So you need to be more creative there. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just add that um, one of the challenges with ESG is that it's a space where there's a lot of opaqueness and a lot of uh, misinformation and the, you know, where uh, companies choose what they want to report. And so for us, it's really important to get to the ground truth. And so you talked about uh, some of the aspects like cybersecurity, but I think others are like, like employees, how you treat your employees. And so what we actually use is some publicly reported government information like, uh, like OSHA violations. You can't, you know, companies can't hide that because the OSHA violations, you know, public reporting is something that we can measure so we know if they're doing better or worse um, you know, treating their employees by having safe working environments. The other is uh, pollution data. Every, every company under the sun now is reporting uh, their carbon footprint, how much carbon they produce um, relative to their sales. But it's all self-reported. And so what we try to do is look at the pollution in those certain areas where we know the companies have factories, for example, and that's something that it's not reported by the company, it's something that we can measure so we can kind of tell when the company is being truthful or not truthful, or just provide a second uh, opinion on what is the company reported information, because it is an area where there's uh, you know, a lot of opaqueness. Okay, so staying with the theme then of challenges and looking at the types of data and data sets, some of it because of this proliferation, there appears to be some trends in the kind of data and data sets that are getting traction and those that seem to be foundering, if you will. And so, and they may, and this may be related to this whole operational problem, but I know, Joe, you had some perspectives on that. I think foundering is a strong word, yeah, but, uh, right. um, <laughs> no, but I think, um, I think what some, sometimes people miss is that um, when you look at the universe of alternative data, some of it, I mean, it's all alternative, you know, relative to structured data that you would find in an Excel file, for example. But uh, there are some domains that have been heavily researched over the last few decades. So, for example, NLP, natural language processing, um, I think is being increasingly used and utilized and developed in, a very, in very fruitful ways. One of the reasons is that there is a backlog of research in computational linguistics, formal semantics, 
that has actually um, taken place over many decades. So if you're a researcher who's looking to apply this data to develop algorithms to process this data, then you have a, a, a good sort of body of work to draw on from academia that will you know, give you some, some guideposts of what to do, what not to do. I think in some of the other types of data, we're talking about some of the, the imagery or the credit card, you know, I think that's very nascent. So I'm not necessarily being skeptical, but I think that, it, you know, it will take time to develop techniques and sort of a body of research work that, you know, supports certain ways of using things and, and other ways of, you know, certain ways of not using things. And I think that's why um, when you see some false starts or you see, um, you know, some data being, being hyped but not necessarily used in real practical applications, I think part of the reason, not all of it, there's an implementation side to it as well, but part of the reason is that, you know, there aren't, there isn't sort of this theoretical foundation, if you will, to sort of support the practical application. And we often forget that, you know, because we're practitioners, we're industry, but it often helps to have that sort of body of work, uh, research work uh, supporting what we do. Anything to add? Yeah, I think uh, when we survey our investors, you know, uh, especially the quant investors, how many data sets, for example, or how, how many of you have found uh, alternatives that would be useful, actually over 50% said that they didn't find any alpha in their data set. And I think exactly that's one of the problem. You know, some of these alternative data sets that have uh, short history, they have, uh, they're not structured, difficult to lend itself to quantitative analysis. Whereas for fundamental investors, I think the task that's actually easier, you know, you don't necessarily need a very long history for this information to be useful for you. So, so I think, you know, maybe there are different perspectives of quant as well as, you know, fundamental investors. Uh, but, you know, I agree, like NLP, for example, is very, very widely, you know, studied, very widely used. So, you know, that's probably one area where everybody is, you know, uh, all, everybody's all over it. But, you know, there are other potential areas where, you know, fundamental investor may find it more useful than quant at the moment. I'll, I'll just I'll just add one one brief comment. I think one of the challenges in the space, particularly for fundamental investors, is that if you think about a fundamental investor, they've been used to working with spreadsheets that have sixty thousand rows at most. Okay, and if you give them, you know, like we were talking about, someone joked earlier, big data is the amount of data that doesn't fit in a spreadsheet. And I actually think that's a really good uh, a good definition. And one of the challenges that they, they, we, that they face is how can they access data that's larger than the spreadsheet? And so I think visualization is a key piece that's, uh, that's undervalued in the market. And I also think it's the critical piece for fundamental investors. Um, we have data providers that come to us all the time and they say, here's, a, here's you know, 10 gigs of data and go process it. And to, for us to process that and get that into a form that a fundamental investor would use is you know, weeks and weeks and weeks of work. And, but it's, uh, very valuable for the data provider to have done that because it broadens their perspective on what kinds of clients can actually use their data. And not to mention, we're focusing on finance here, but the corporate world and private equity world are people who are even like less kind of quantitative than we are in the finance world. And that uh, having those good visualizations is very, very useful for those kind of clients. And it just makes the data much, much more accessible to someone who uh, may be interested but not very familiar with how to code in Python, for example. Yeah, I totally agree. You know, so you know, we have a team of uh, over 100 fundamental analysts, and then we have a team of, let's say, data scientists, for example. But these two teams are actually totally separate. So even when we receive alternative data from data vendors, and we, let's say, process this data, we may not necessarily know exactly what the fundamental analysts have in mind. So it's very important for them to work together. Otherwise, we might have spent you know, 10 hours you know, normalizing the data, cleaning the data, and it turns out to be something that a fundamental, fundamental analyst doesn't need. Uh, I'll actually just add to that last comment because I think that the real mistake in the industry right now is hiring people from totally outside of finance to lead these teams where they don't know the language and don't know what's important to these fundamental analysts. I think the firm, you see lots of turnover at these firms where they, they go and hire someone from, from Uber is a good example, um, where they, they come in and they just real, you know, the, the finance guys and the analysts and the, those teams of PMs say like, look, we want to look at the data in this way. We want, you know, we need it to track these KPIs. And that education process is actually quite a long process. And so something that I would advocate to other firms trying to get in the space and is to really try to think of, find people who have been in the finance space that are kind of familiar with what are important questions, as well as the, the kind of the, the take it seriously enough that they know, okay, this is gonna be used to make P and L. And once you have, if you have managers who realize, okay, we can make and lose money based on this data. It kind of raises the bar a whole other level to, uh, to so that those data scientists really take it seriously. Hey, can I add to that? Sure. I, I agree with that, actually. The sentiment that um, it's often, often underestimated 
um, how unique financial data is when you hire some of these non-finance data science types. For example, if you think about a time series, we're talking about big data. Actually, most of our world is small data, right? Because, you know, relative to natural science, we have smaller data sets, right? We have one history of the S&P 500. We don't have a thousand trials like we can do in genomics or, let's say, in cosmology, where you have billions of stars, right? Okay, and think about the properties of financial data, volatility clustering, momentum, mean reversion, all the things that we know and love, all of that stuff is connected to human intentionality. That's the source, right? It's human behavior. And if you don't have experience with financial data and you just come in out of the blue and you're an expert on every algorithm ever created, but you've only worked with data from natural science, you're gonna have a, a large, learn, a big learning curve. And I think that's underappreciated. And also, if you think about it, just going out to the, sm the small data challenge is, is very important, right? Because when you build a trading strategy, the, the risk of false positives is so high. And I think that can be underappreciated by somebody with just a pure statistics background. So I think it was a good point. I think um, this is sort of an, an HR point in a way, but I mean, it, I think it's important to realize that part of the adoption of all data and data in general, we have to remember that it's, it's a financial investment application that we're talking about, which has its own unique quirks. Yeah, I think financial data, especially compared to the other ones, the signal to noise ratio is very, very low. So, you know, like we would be lucky to find something that predicts maybe, you know, 52%, 53% of the time, you know, whereas some of these people coming from other industries, maybe they expect a hit ratio of 95%. Uh, so there's definitely a disconnect there that we need to educate those people on. Yeah, and I, <clears throat> and I also think there has to be kind of a two-way approach there from data vendors, um, those data vendors that actually are building out those new data sets more, more kind of on the startup phase. They need, to be, they need to come from the financial background as well. Some of them building out data sets not knowing the, um, the financial kind of framework, how um, financial analysts are actually looking at these data sets. So um, they're not necessarily providing you the cleanest data. So what everybody wants are the, that structured, more derived point in time data without any look ahead biases. So first of all, like uh, you need to provide that clean data. And from the fundamental managers, uh, once they've incorporated this, this data team, of course, hopefully with the with the right backgrounds, uh, they need to be able to understand what's the value in those data sets. If the data sets they're getting, uh, it's not clean, um, it's hard to extract value from those data sets. So, but um, in order to have even those conversations with the, your data providers, um, you need to be able to understand how to extract value in it um, during those POCs, understand what, what the ROI for this, for this data set is, even to understand what it does, what it actually costs to you. So there needs to be a kind of like both approaches from data vendor side as well as the um, fund, uh, funds themselves. Okay, so transitioning and moving into uh, a related question, which, which we've touched on a bit already, but uh, in, the, in the landscape of alternative data providers, it's all shapes and sizes. So in many cases, you may be dealing with some of the larger providers and integrators where they have big data science teams and data scientists and uh, all kinds of account management support functions and all that. Uh, and then there's the smaller you know, groups, you know, with probably somewhere south of 10 employees who have a very unique and potentially very useful uh, data set, um, but none of that support. Uh, so it's going to take uh, more resources on your end to kind of make sense out of it and do something with it. So can you comment on how you look at that and what you deal with there? Who would like to start that? Okay, I'll go. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. I mean, one, you're speaking on the one hand to the institutional aspect of, the, of, a, of a data provider. You know, do they have the support and all that? On the other hand, the uniqueness. Unique, uniqueness can be taken in a positive light or, or a negative light. So I think when you look at a, a data provider, on the one hand, you're asking, yes, you know, what is interesting and novel about this? Can I integrate it into my investment process? But I think we all have, are starting to have increasingly more uh, concerns about where is the data coming from, privacy concerns, you know, is this, you know, is how reliable is this data, can, you know, where is it being sourced from, is it, are the ethics involved in it? Mm -hmm. 
I think especially for long, large quant managers, that's uh, first and foremost uh, a major concern. And then secondly, to your point about the institutional side, but yeah, I do think there is a benefit. Um, it's just like any other business, right? Reputation is built slowly. Some of the firms that are a little bit larger and have built a reputation, they have a support staff that are willing to work with you to sort of think about their data better, to maybe apply it in, in certain ways. I think that's valuable. And I think, you know, not to put down the smaller firms because there's always value to be found everywhere, potentially. But I think, um, I, I think the large quant managers, the more established quant managers would be more inclined to work with firms that they can trust. And trust is an institutional idea, but it also has to do with the sort of the ethical side. And if you've been around for a while and you've stayed in business and you've grown your business, that's a good sign. Okay. Other comments? I think the survivorship within the smaller data sets are actually a concern from some of the fund managers. Um, the startup data providers um, may not have that cash flow to sustain themselves long term. Um, sometimes the business kind of like business strategies could be questionable as well there. So you need to look into that um, specific concern, whether that particular small data provider will even going to be able to sustain themselves long term, even though um, they may have something unique there. So uh, it goes back to the idea of um, what's the background of this data set as well. So like uh, the uh, founders, do they have a uh, kind of financial background? Are they looking at uh, structuring this data, deriving this data in the right formats as well? Um, so, and uh, more and more what we're seeing, um, uh, kind of the, uh, the way um, the types of data sets, uh, newer data sets out there, it's easy to replicate with, uh, say, a variety of open source um, uh, NLPs and uh, other machine learning techniques and um, it, it, the competition is, is huge out there. So um, it's harder to survive for some of these smaller firms and I would say um, uh, there will be opportunity for larger data providers to either build something like that in-house because there's more trust for somebody who may um, you know, uh, you don't have concern, uh, concerns regarding survivorship and so on. So uh, they may start building out some of the new data sets out of bigger uh, data providers um, or even absorb, absorbing some of these smaller data providers, their IPs and so on. So that could be um, somewhere we, we'll, we'll be moving. Yep. I, I, I'll, I'll just add one just general trend that is not specific to data providers, but also relates to data vendors. What we've seen in the industry over the last probably like 24 months is, and I guess going back further before that, but it's driven by uh, the low startup cost of technology firms. Um, all you need is a couple of guys doing Python. You can hire them anywhere around the world, and it's very, very cheap. And But what has happened is you we started to see these firms that do one thing really, really, really well, one narrow, narrow thing. It's something that the, the big guys kind of don't care about. Um, and so what, what, from our perspective, it actually may be a good value play to, to buy that service from that one, that one provider because you know, a big institution may not care about that one niche, but that one niche may be very, very important to us. And so we've been evaluating a few data providers or, or you know, technology solution providers that are very narrow as opposed to trying to convince a Bloomberg or a, a Reuters to spend more money on that one area. And so I think this nichiness is something that is very important because we also like it because that, that firm has all their skin in the game on that one topic to make it work. And so they are very, very committed to make sure that idea works as opposed to a big institution which is very, very more, more diverse, diversified, which may not care about that one niche thing that we may find very, very valuable. All right, so uh, one area that uh, kind of crosses everything that we haven't touched on yet is the whole area of regulation and the evolving regulatory risk landscape and how that could affect uh, what you do. Uh, so I'd like, uh, like to throw that out to whoever would like to be first. I'll just frame it uh, uh, in the context of the name I give it. I give it the Elizabeth Warren risk where you, you, can, you can just imagine the headline that where if she understood 
kind of all the different data that's out there on individuals and corporations, uh, that there could just be a, a, a maelstrom of, uh, of headlines that would you know, be something where she's saying, look, I'm going to protect your rights as an individual, and uh, this whole infrastructure is something that uh, we need to attack. And I think that actually is a pretty large risk. And so that's why most firms, like you heard uh, uh, M Science earlier, take a very conservative view with uh, this because of that uh, sort of headline risk issue. Other thoughts? So from data provider view, I would say we always have to consider um, those, uh, those kind of regulations coming out of Europe, for instance. So things like GDPR and one that came out, is coming out from California, California Consumer Act. So we always have to be on top of what's going on, right? So like what data we're collecting, what are the implications that could be? So essentially, uh, not avoiding the the uh, personal identifiable information. If you are aggregating that, that should be fine. But you should always kind of like um, be on top of those regulations as well as the MIFID II, right? So uh, our models have that transparency. MIFID II requires that transparency uh, and not the black box solution. So. Um, for us, for instance, we provide that transparency in all the models that we build. So from the, from the data provider standpoint, you always have to be on top of these different regulations. Um, and in terms of the, for, for the investment managers, um, the data team always has to work with their compliance officers, compli legal, de legal departments, potentially build out questionnaires for the data providers, how they're actually collecting this data do they have transparency on this uh, data, data set? So uh, making sure um, these processes are in place um, to avoid any um, sort of implications there. Um, yeah, and so um, that's basically. Sure. Yeah, I mean, think, I think there's, there could be a silver lining. Look, if you, the, the worst case scenario is that you get so much regulation of the data that it becomes commoditized, right? And then what does a data provider, how does that business model work on an ongoing basis? Well, uh, on their side, it may turn out that um, their job becomes just to curate and clean and, and sort of deliver uh, you know, a very similar type of, of offering uh, that their competitors are also delivering. But it's all, all may not be lost, though, because even if that's the case, which I don't even know, I'm not going to make a prediction on that, um, then the burden would fall back onto asset management. Right? Because then uh, it, would, it would say, okay, we get it. There's this uh, universe of now highly commoditized alt data out there. Um, the providers will, st you know, the large ones will still have a business model. They'll be going concerns because they can clean the data for us and deliver it to us. But now it's our job to actually beat our competitors using this highly commoditized data. So what am I getting at? Now there's a little bit of magic bulletism with some of the alt data, right? In other words, even if your investment process is not that good or flexible or, or, you know, and so on, you may think that if I just find the right data provider, I get the right sort of secret sauce all data stream, I can win. Well, if you get this commoditization that we're sort of envisioning, this dystopia, if you will, in all data, then you may get, um, it may be less interesting and spicy in some respects, but what it'll separate the wheat from the chaff on the, on the asset manager side even more because there will be you know, quant, quant or fundamental managers that will be able to actually utilize this commoditized data set more than others. So I think all will not be lost, although it'll be a, a, maybe a slightly less interesting world, I guess, but um, we'll see. All right, so now I think uh, we'll switch themes. So we've talked an awful lot about challenges of one sort or another. Uh, now I'd like to flip the switch over to success stories. So I would like... Uh, the panel members to share, you know, their experiences in a, what has worked for them or what they're aware has worked for others. And uh, if you could give some perspectives on that as well as some of the key factors that made a difference. Yeah, sure. So I think one of the things I want to emphasize um, in this discussion is that the key, the, the keys, key drivers to success is the creativity of the analysts and the researchers. And you know, I'll share just one story of something that I'm not sure if it's a, a true or legend or just lore, um, but it was a story that I heard uh, told to me um, from like the 60s and 70s. There was an analyst who was researching uh, McDonald's and realized that every time they went to McDonald's, they would get they would get a receipt, 
And on this receipt, of course, there's you know what they ordered: a burger, a milkshake, and of course there were, that at that time there were probably five you know five items on the menu, and they all cost a nickel. Um, but the what they also had in this receipt was a, an order number, and this order number ranged from zero to up to they they figured like nine hundred ninety nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine. So a really, really high number, more than what could be sold by any one given McDonald's in a, in a given week or a given month. And so what this analyst did is they just realized, okay, I can go to the, at the McDonald's at the beginning of the month, go at the end of the month, and then I can actually get a pretty good accurate estimate of how many McDonald's receipts there were. And so this is an example of, it's not that the data wasn't out there. The data was out there. The analyst was just being very creative with it. And so I think this is the, you'll find this, theme throughout any of these examples of the analyst just has to be creative with how they use the data sets. And we have many, many examples where analysts ask very, very narrow questions and can address those questions via web scraping or an example uh, from a, 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 bat, a vendor data set. But it's all about the analyst having a good question that they can answer creatively by, by going to the internet or going to an example uh, data vendor. And that McDonald's example I'm willing to share because it's something that you know I'm not even sure if it's true or not, but I think it exemplifies the example of being very creative with your questions. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, besides the kind of, you know, equities world, which I think a lot of uh, things have been highly commoditized, you know, quantitative managers have invested a lot in it. I think, you know, in other asset classes, there are definitely, you know, more room for kind of uh, the use of alternative data, you know. So let's say we've looked at, uh, in Europe, for example, a small market called a dividend futures market, where the payoff of the instrument depends on how much dividend a company pays. And you know, a company can control exactly how much dividend it pays. It cannot control what its PE ratio is, but you can say, well, you want next quarter I'm gonna pay this much dividend. So, you know, when we look at NLP and look at you know transcript analysis to say, okay, how has the sentiment on dividend has changed? And does that have predictive power in dividend futures? Actually we find you know much stronger predictive power on it than on the stock prices itself. So I think, you know, uh, I would suggest not just focus on at the equities market, but you know a lot of the other markets out there, whether it's derivatives or fixed income. I think there's you know a lot of uh, potential, and you know we've found some initial success there already. Yeah, I would just like I said, sentiment analysis, NLPs, I think are the most uh, interesting um, uh, recent sort of things that we've seen uh, in terms of actually applicable uh, sets of all data. Yeah, so I would I would add to that as well. I actually agree with the, with Jonathan here. Um, creativity matters a lot, and especially so for fundamental managers who are used to using just uh, potentially just fundamental models, the traditional fundamental models. They need to start incorporating new alternative data sources. And how do you do that, right? So first of all, adapting adapting this new. Uh, um, dedicated data teams that work with investment managers and um, really go through iterative approach and kind of working hand in hand to understand what are the uh, key drivers for uh, certain industries, what are the KPIs, what are the descriptors of a, a particular, maybe what drives this particular stock. And kind of thinking outside of the box, so um, there might be data sets out there that you don't even know, but your data team might be um, out there in the field going to conferences like this, uh, bringing you those new data sets and kind of having that approach where you are creative in the way that you incorporate, try to incorporate variety of data sources into the um, investment process other than fundamental will help you um, succeed essentially. So. Um, that approach, I feel like um, that what will help yeah, fundamental managers get go to the next level. All right, so it is time for the moment of truth question. So we've been sitting up here for about 40 minutes or so talking about today's environment. So this question has to do with what the future holds. So think maybe five years out, 2025, so will there be continued proliferation of data and data sets? Will there be consolidation? Will several handful of integrators do everything? Uh, what data will get obsoleted? What will go away? What will stay? So I'd like every panel member to put their prognostication forward. Well, I think the, there will definitely be a winnowing of uh, the firms that are providing uh, alt data. Um, 
data types, well, I think it may, depends on what you mean by a data type. I think there will be the, the sort of general categories that we're all discussing today, I think, will remain. I think the variations on each theme will, will sort of narrow as well. Firm-wise, I'm not sure. I think it's hard to say who's going to prosper, who's going to die. I just think there will be less firms. Um, some will figure out how to do it well, uh, and they will survive and become a little bit bigger. Um, and then it's inevitable that there will be some commoditization of all data, but you know, depending on the regulations, maybe not all the way. So we'll see. Okay. Yeah, I think there will definitely be consolidation of uh, external data vendors. Uh, you know, maybe every data type there will be you know two or three you know best players that survive. But I think you know for larger firms, they will probably also be able to catch up with you know developing these capabilities in house, like NLP capability in house, for example. Um, so. So you know that's one aspect. Another aspect is probably I would say you know in terms of asset classes right now you know alternative data is still mainly applied to equities, but I would say you know across asset classes five years from now we'll uh, see wide applications. So yeah, very similar thought here. Consolidation, of course, yes. Yeah, so larger data providers consolidating um, and uh, newer data sets built out of those larger. Um, data providers as well, uh, usage of uh, internal data. So it may look very different from uh, what, how, fund, uh, how investment managers use their internal data versus how um, data providers use their internal data. But for somebody like um, us, um, I just market, we could potentially uh, utilize our um, internal data that we're sitting on for potentially um, create a better customer experience or suggest data sets to some of our clients that um, similar data sets that potentially they've been subscribing to, so similar to what Netflix and those FANG companies are doing, so essentially adapting that, um, that framework where you use that um, uh, data to suggest um, to make suggestions on what data, next data sets to subscribe to. And uh, marketplaces will see more of those. I mean, we're already seeing a lot of those marketplaces, but um, eventually there'll be a leader, and those ones will be able to use that kind of Netflix approach using their internal data. I feel like those would be the leaders in it. Um, and um, really more need for the uh, structured data because um, machine learning and AI is still, those techniques are, te techniques are still underutilized um, and those will need a lot more data. We will see a lot more data, but this data needs to be more structured and we, need, we will need more history. So need for good quality data will always be there, even more so with machine learning. Um, yeah, and, and new data sources, of course, potentially uh, Internet of Things as, as though those develop a little bit more. Um, uh, so maybe less um, uh, of those uh, data sets that kind of um, naturally come from the digi digitalized sources. Um, so we'll see more usage of like, um, uh, of the, uh, the, the registration data, bill of lading data, and so on. So, Jonathan, we've got a couple minutes, so go yeah, for it. Yeah, sure. So, I, I, I guess a couple comments. Um, the first is something that uh, uh, was alluded to just now. I think I'll make a prediction about salaries. I said, so, I think that the salaries of data engineers is going to skyrocket. There's going to be, for a top-notch data engineer, which right now is not the most luxurious job, that person is going to be paid much, much more than they were in the past. We, there's a proliferation of kinds of data like text, video, even you know, uh, uh, voice. Um, these are the kind of things that are going to be processed so you can allow what you are just talking about, the, da the data scientists to actually use machine learning and use uh, advanced techniques. And so having the data clean, processed by an expert data engineer is something that's become more and more important going forward. So that, that's one comment. The, the second comment that I think is, is uh, I have more of a hope as opposed to a prediction is that in the ESG space, which is becoming very big for Alliance Bernstein, for example, is there's many, many different kinds of disparate data sets that are actually produced by uh, nonprofits. I think that one thing that I would be hopeful about in the future is that these nonprofits can start to share their data with uh, capital markets. And so 
Yeah, I was just uh, talking to someone from Greenpeace um, a couple weeks ago where they did a big, a big report on plastics. Which companies are producing the mo most, pla most pla plastics, you know, plastic waste in the world? And I, I asked them, I said, oh, so do you have this data map to QCIP or CEDAW or ISIN? And she said, QCIP or CEDAW, ISIN what? Like, what are those words? And so I hope that there's more of a pro pro partnership between NGOs and capital markets, because if you think about it, the capital markets are a natural way for these NGOs to actually have an uh, impact on their, uh, on their mission. We can, we can have in engagements with these companies. We can actually institute change. And having the raw data or the alternative data there as a way to do that is something that can be very, very valuable. And I sort of hope that that's something that happens in the future as, uh, as we get, get more and more data and more and more of these nonprofits come to realize that the capital markets are a way that they can further their mission uh, in the marketplace. All right. I guess that's, we're at the end of our time, are we not? Yes, sir. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.